there, everyone. Again, Erin Thomas, and it's a pleasure to be here today. I'd like to start out first with this story um, about a conversation that my son and I had on the way here. He looked around Atlanta and was excited about the Grand Marquis Hotel, and he said, look, all I had to do to get a room here was spend seven years in foster care. Ain't that something, right? <laughs> and, um, you know, we laughed about it, but it sent the sense of regret and kind of remorse through me when I thought about everything we had already missed along the way. So that's why today I've titled my story, The Long Way Home. What I'd like to do today is to shed some light on my own recovery journey, how I got to where I am today, and most importantly, the role that my son, Tata, played in that journey. For me, my challenges started many years before my first encounter with drugs and alcohol. My mother lived with mental health challenges and substance abuse disorder, and my dad frequently abused alcohol. Anyway, aside from that, <laughs> see, my early childhood memories were filled with love and adventure and fishing with my dad and all the fun I had with my extended family. However, I was ultimately defined by the feelings of loneliness and abandonment that followed as I watched my parents' marriage come to an end, which I blamed myself for because shortly after they divorced, my daughter was born. I was 15 years old. I realized quickly that I wasn't sure how to care for a baby girl. I was still a baby girl myself. And with my parents divorced and my mom living in another city, I did the best that I could to make ends meet. And I struggled, but was hired and fired from many jobs along the way. I eventually started to follow in the footsteps of my parents, experimenting with drugs and alcohol and trying to cope with the feelings that I was having. But after the birth of my second son, Mason, my addiction was harder to hide. I struggled with substance use during my pregnancy and was unable to completely stop using entirely. So this further reinforced the narrative that had been playing in my mind for so long. I began to believe the words of my family and I had resigned to the fact that I would always be a bad mom, a high school dropout, and a drug addict. Not long after he was born, DFAX was contacted and my children were taken into state custody. I was issued your standard case plan, which included drug and alcohol assessment, housing, transportation, employment, parenting classes, you know what I'm talking about. But I was instantly defeated, instantly. I couldn't even stay clean long enough to pass a drug screen. I had been abusing drugs by this point for many years to numb out the feelings that I was feeling and to run from the things that I didn't think I was capable of doing. After being given that list of, from DFACS of seemingly impossible tasks, I, I just gave up entirely. So with my children in foster care and not seeing any way to reunite with them, I turned my head and I ran in the opposite direction for many years. During that time, I was in and out of prisons, jails, rehabs, outpatient facilities, but I never really had any long-term success. I spent almost seven years in the custody of the Georgia Department of Corrections. And while I was in custody, there was one constant factor that helped me to feel a little more connected to my son. His CASA, Seth Martin, was the only person that I knew who had been by Mason's side since practically day one. And knowing that he had a strong, positive male role model to look up to helped me to find a little bit of peace while I was incarcerated and to find a little bit of contentment while I was away. But at this point in my life, I, I didn't believe in myself. I certainly didn't believe in recovery. And I certainly didn't believe in my ability to be a good mom. Honestly, most days, I felt like my children were better off without me. But again, I always knew that Seth was a phone call away. I didn't really understand his role at that time, but I could see it was something good for Mason. So it made me happy. The first time I was in prison, I ended up staying there for a little over three years. The majority of that time I spent hating myself and missing my children. In 2014, I was released from prison to a fake parole address with no money and nowhere to go. The only goal that I had for myself was to stay out of prison. It was also in 2014 that I made one of the hardest decisions of my life. I voluntarily surrendered my parental rights to Mason. My time to work a case plan had ended, and my addiction was worse than ever. 
So I quickly turned my attention back to the only thing that I knew. My drug use intensified, and I began to do things that I said I would never do. Within just a few short months, I was using methamphetamines intravenously with a habit that cost over $200 a day. I committed multiple crimes in various communities to fund weekly hotel rooms and to pay for the very addiction that robbed me of my freedom and ultimately took my children from me. I was arrested again within a year, of course, and uh, this year, this time, they gave me an eight-year prison sentence. I would go on to serve four long years behind those walls. During that time, my mom passed away from an overdose of fentanyl at the age of 55. My grandmother passed away exactly nine months later, and less than a year later, I lost my grandson in a tragic car accident. So that sentence was really scary for me, and I, I thought I was going to lose hope. But it was during that sentence that I found my purpose. I enrolled in the faith and character dorm and was able to take classes and attend groups that helped me not only to address my past, but it helped me to understand how to accept my future, my present, rather, and to finally look forward to my future. I was assigned to a detail as a caseworker. I mean, a counsel caseworker. As a counsel, <laughs> no. <laughs> I don't know, maybe. <laughs> I was assigned to a detail as a counselor's aide, which was basically the job that I did for the state for free, and um, it was an administrative assistant position. But that's where I found my calling. I was given the privilege to facilitate and create self-help groups that not only helped me to help others, but it let me grow in ways that I never thought were possible. I began then to intentionally prepare myself for the day that I would be released. And that day came in early 2019. This time, I had secure housing, administrative experience, and the skills that I needed to find a job. I finally began to believe in myself and in my ability to be a good mother. So I wasn't sure when or even if it would ever happen. But since I didn't have rights to my children anymore, I thought that maybe one day they would try to find me. And when they did, I wanted to be the very best version of me and a mom they would be proud of. It took me over a year after my release from prison to work up the courage to reach out to Barrow County DFACS. I had no legal rights to my son, and I was terrified they would turn me away. And I waited so long to reach out to them because I was tormented by four little words, termination of parental rights. Making that call was absolutely terrifying. I asked my daughter for my son's caseworker's phone number, but instead she gave me sets. So I finally reached out to Seth, and he suggested that I make contact with Mason's caseworker. So I called Ms. Kelly King from Barrow County, and what I discovered during that phone call was absolutely heartbreaking, but it also provided me with the hope that I so desperately needed. I found out that after 14 different placements, my son was on the cold case roster, and he was not yet adopted. When I talked to his caseworker that day, I was able to present to her my whole self, the woman that I'd worked so hard to become. So she and her supervisor talked and they said if Mason was receptive, that I could see him again. So they agreed, we had a visit for the first time in seven years. And right in the middle of the pandemic, I complied with every single request that DFAC sent my way. I'm so happy to say that in May of 2020, Mason was returned to my care. And in July of last year, I got to hear four words, parental rights were reinstated. <laughs> Thank you. Had I not learned to trust in my son's relationship with the CASA, I don't think I would have ever made that phone call. I didn't have much faith in defects, and I only knew that I would regret not trying. So when it came time to go to court, Seth was there not only to advocate for Mason, but also to advocate for me, which was incredible. And the relationship that they have now is amazing. We call Seth a friend of the family now. He's included in birthday parties. We go out to eat together, and he is the world's best mediator <laughs> when it comes to trying to figure out how to parent a teenager. 
because they do not come with instruction manuals. <laughs> and, um, you know, no parenting classes in life would prepare you for getting to know your son again after all that time. But with him around, it, it helps. <laughs> Today, I can speak to you from a place that I thought was absolutely impossible. I met all of the goals that I set for myself, and I have been sober for almost six years. <laughs> I am now in compliance fully with the requirements of my parole, and I have a great deal of confidence in myself and in this process. I am a graduate of the Respect Institute of Georgia, but I also have the pleasure to be employed by the Georgia Mental Health Consumer Network, where I'm the training coordinator for that program. I also serve on the Georgia Parental Advisory Council for DFACTS, and I was recently honored with the Reunification Hero Award for not only the state of Georgia, but also nationally from the American Bar Association. My goals for the future are simple. I'd like to continue to advocate for my peers who are struggling to find their way through their own recovery journeys. I look forward to mentoring men and women who are navigating their own defects case plans. And I hope to one day collaborate with policymakers and legislators in the field of child welfare by using my story to shed light on the parents' perspective. I do look forward one day to owning my own home, helping my children with college, and even returning to school myself one day. If I could leave some advice for my peers, I would say take the time to get to know your CASA. Ask questions if you don't understand their role in your child's life. I ran from the idea of a court appointed anything in the picture, <laughs> but because of that, I was terrified of that same process that changed my life and brought my children back to me. And also, it's okay to take things slowly. It took me over a year to reach out to Barrow County defects and to Seth. But I was determined to put the pieces of my life back together. And in doing so, my family was ultimately restored, but it did not happen overnight. So set goals for yourself, short-term goals to help keep you motivated, and long-term goals to remind you where you're going. I would also like to take a moment, if I may, to offer some advice to the CASA volunteers and staff. I would like to suggest that you get to know your parents like you get to know our children. I've seen such amazing growth in Mason because of the trust that I have in Seth. And by taking time to educate us about your role, you're helping us to get, put our guard down and to look past that court-appointed title. That's scary. <laughs> and also, please be mindful that there are many different pathways to recovery. Each parent may take a different road, but we're all headed in the same place because recovery is real. And I'm evidence that while we don't always choose the fastest route, even the long way leads to home. In closing, I would like to say thank you. Thank you. Your dedication and commitment to our children reaches far beyond any case plan or court mandate. The impact that you have is immeasurable, and our youth are better because of it. Again, thank you. My name is Erin Thomas. I appreciate you listening to my story. She, she sure does deserve a standing ovation. So once again, my name is Seth. Um, I am the... The whisper, Mason whisper, as uh, Casa would call it, uh, his confidant, Zaxby's sugar daddy, uh, and, and most importantly, once again, Mason's Casa. Um, me and Mason, you know, we, we started out a few years ago. Uh, the, the road when we first met was, uh, was pretty interesting. Came to a house to meet him, this young kid talked to him, he said, hey, and then left. It's like, okay, well, I see how this relationship is going to go. But uh, after a few years, a few long road trips, four hours down to Thomasville, and uh, pretty much everywhere throughout Georgia, our relationship blossomed quite a bit. Um, 
First of all, I'd like to thank the good Lord who made all this possible. Without him, me and Mason or me and Aaron probably would have strangled Mason by now. But um, but with him, you know, uh, Aaron's made an amazing transformation, um, as well as as she mentioned, Mason. Uh, when we when I first met Mason, um, he struggled getting up, wouldn't go to school. Um, we're just a few of the things to mention. And uh, we just talked today. He's in a construction class, uh, welding class, and uh, I'm sure he'll get back into his marine biology, which is his future goal. Um, I want to thank everybody at, at Barrow Casa, um, Jude. I don't know the, the newer ones, but Jude and uh, Brittany, Brittany was the one that, that was my avid, um, coordinator through it. She helped me all the time. Um, when I, for the first few times, when I'd go and talk to Mason, and he said, yeah, no, yeah, okay. Um, and I was banging my head up against the wall, like, what, what am I supposed to do here? What, he won't say anything to me, he tells me nothing. Bree would, or Brittany would encourage me, give me some ideas and some good steps. Um, I don't have a story like Aaron wrote out, but I did just want to give a few tips that, that worked with me um, with Mason. So first, you know, one of the things that I found um, as I worked with Mason is that um, I as I listened to him more um, and talked less and encouraged him, that's, that's when our relationship blossomed more. Um, he had a tough road. He'd get into some situations like, like typical teenagers would, um, but it, you know, it seemed like the calls would be, hey, Mason did this, he did that, so on and so forth. And uh, at first, I'd try to, you know, like tell him, like, you can't, you can't do that, man. You can't, you know, you can't, you got to do this. You can't do that. But um, as I let him talk and I listened to him um, and, and just encouraged him, uh, just let him know, like, hey, wh what did you learn? What could you do better next time? That's, that's when um, I think our relationship really went to the next step. Um, encouraging the parents, you know, Aaron, Aaron really defied the odds and she took a huge step in calling me and reaching out. Um, and when she did, I told her, you know, this is awesome. I'll connect you with defects. And I kind of guided her along the way and re-encouraged her, um, made sure that, that she could, she knew that she could do it. Um, and, and that's big because a lot of the parents, you know, we meet them when they're at their lowest and they need a lot of encouragement. And that goes a long way. Uh, last but not least is reunification is never off the table. Um, I know that's what we're here for is reunification. And, uh, you know, in Aaron's case, she, her, her rights were terminated. Um, and I know that as in, in a court case, we probably figure when rights are terminated, that's the end of the story. Let's keep it moving. Um, and in, in, in Mason's case or in Aaron's case, um, you know, Aaron did the right steps, what she needed to do um, to, to better herself and uh, put herself in the right situation so her rights could be reinstated. So um, once again, if you all would please join me in congr congratulating Aaron. And I won't point out Mason. He doesn't like attention. We won't point him out, but if y'all would please give a standing ovation for Mason. As he did just as awesome job as Aaron. Uh, and, uh, back over to Julia. Thank you all.